Hello and welcome to Fräulein Brehm's Life of Animals. Have you heard of Alfred Brehm and his wonderful Life of Animals? Back in the 1800s, it was a bestseller. Today, you're about to witness Fräulein Brehm's Life of Animals. And that Fräulein, that's me. Don't ask if we are related. Fact is, without Alfred, there would be no Fräulein. In the beginning, there was Alfred. And just like Alfred Brehm, Fräulein Brehm looks deeply into the lives and times of animals. The following story is not fictitious and any similarity to actual creatures, living or dead, has been scientifically observed and carefully noted. The earthworm. Lumbricus terrestris, king of the animals. Alfred says, in the beginning of every worm is the head, where there is an extraordinary string of nerve fibers that transports information from the sensory cells on the worm's skin directly to the lower cerebral ganglion, which is complemented by the upper cerebral ganglion, which amounts to the worm's brain, albeit a very modest brain. For lack of teeth, he gobbles and gulps food through his mouth that has been prepared, cooked and served up for him by billions of microorganisms. Protostomes Earthworms are gourmets of a kind. They possess exquisite taste buds in the head region that allow them to distinguish between what they do and do not like. Alfred says, if they do not find their nourishing puree, they prepare, almost cook their own food by pulling whatever they come across into their burrows. Everyone knows that the leaves, feathers, straws that one finds in the early morning hours as if they were planted there by children are being abducted during the hours of darkness by earthworms of all sorts. The leaf of a raspberry bush torn off. A mighty straw will be pulled with such force that it will snap right in the middle. Well, Alfred is not exaggerating in the least. Just look at this. Even Rumpelstiltskin would envy that. During the dinner, worms ensconce their rear ends inside the burrow. Worm home alone. Earthworms urinate via elegantly named nephridiae two on each column, which have funneled lashes that effectively lash urea out of the worm's body. Now, we all know the fantastic sensation of relief when we need a pee and are allowed to let go. Imagine having that lovely sensation all over your entire body. I leave you with these thoughts to dwell on. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you worm's gut. The worm's gut is particularly attractive for microorganisms. It functions as a means of transport, a downright travel agent, as microbes insist on traveling almost exclusively with the excrement of worms. Via the anus, at the end of the worm's body, microbes reach their final destination where they're being ushered in and around beautifully situated worm casts. And action! Took an hour to get this pretty worm to do this, mind. Worms Master plaster caster, castings extraordinaire. Lumbricus terrestris, profession, keeper of the edaphon, mother earth and potential savior of the climate. The most noble and most pure hummus is produced by the family of Isenia Fertida. I have brought along. Thank you very much. A slightly mineral note with an aromatic hint of spice. 
Thank you so much. The dear God knoweth how to make good earth and has shared his secret with a family of earthworms. I vote for the completion of the saying by adding worms, colleagues, microorganisms. They're being kissed and awakened by the action of the worms, just like sleeping beauty, slumbering peacefully in the chambers of the earth, awaiting Prince Lumbricus. Sleeping beauty in an edition of billions and billions. As soon as she's awakened, she thrives splendidly and multiplies remarkably well. The moment Madame Microbe has reached her final destination, she will carry on for a period of time before once again falling into a deep and restful sleep until the next Prince Lumbricus comes kissingly along. So, to be or not to be digested by Lumbricus terrestris doesn't seem to do microbes any harm, provided they own a thick skin, which doesn't seem to be the case with Salmonella bacteria. They're being practically <coughs> obliterated. It's a lumbricide. But worms are far from heartless. They are equipped with five twosomes of hearts, mighty, ventrally pumping muscular organs, which provide a pulsating red bloodstream. And um, by golly, just look at this connective tissue. It works just like a spiral spring. It is extremely elastic, very resilient, and therefore perfectly shaped to foster Lumbricus's muscle power. Lumbricus terrestris is the Schwarzenegger amongst earthworms, one singular biceps, ring muscles, diagonal muscles, a whole round up of muscles. One kilogram of power may be summed up in one square centimeter. Maximum strength can only be rendered within the burrow, naturally. Instead of bones, we find a Hydroskeleton, sturdy yet flexible at the same time. The hydroskeleton is divided up in chambers called colum. Worms have between 60 and 200 chambers running the length of their bodies. And each of those chambers commands an astonishing set of bristles. These bristles allow worms to brace themselves when birds of a feather try to pull them out of their burrows. Worms don't always win this war of the worlds and Oftentimes, a certain number of rear chambers, a few bits and bobs, need be abandoned. As long as no vital organs are affected, lost body parts may be regenerated. Moles. Moles are known to hoard living worms in their pantry. They bite through the nervous fiber right behind the modest cerebral ganglion. Worm is alive but cannot move an inch. One single mole has been known to have hoarded 800 gram of living worms. Well, it's all right if you don't own a fridge, but Lumbricus plays an important part in the nourishment of big wigs. Thousands of different worms exist worldwide, and their names are as poetic as the edaphon in which they live. Annelid, Lumbricus festivus, Dendrobena illyrica, Isenia lucens, Allolobophora chlorotica. Megascolida australis, a worm of two to three meters of length and a diameter of up to eight centimeters. And a very pretty one, Aporectodia smaragdina. In Edaphon Souterrain, right under the first residue of plants and organic material, lives the epigaic type of worm, the compost dwellers, Isenia fertida, Dendrodrilus rubidus, Lumbricus rubellus, Dendrobena octraeda, an octangular wormling. First, basement is occupied by endogaic worms like Aporectodia caliginosa, Aporectodia rosea, and of course, Fräulein's favorite, 
Allolobophora chlorotica, the little green plowing worm. He gulps his way through the edaphon, leaving his little heaps of hummus close to the surface. Those worms are the most sensitive to light as they practically never see the light of day. Sutera, first and second basement, are home to anaic worms, deep borrowing worms like Lumbricus terrestris or Lumbricus badensis. They are big, strong, long-living creatures. They can live up to seven, even ten years. They procreate less than their epigeic neighbors. Instead, their permanent burrows sometimes are inherited by their descendants or turned into floral pantries, as the case may be. Main season for worms is most certainly springtime and autumn, which thoughtful farmers will pay homage to before tilling or harvesting their fields. Attention, please. Your attention, please. Soil is an acid that cannot be multiplied. What's gone is gone. The edaphon is destroyed if ploughed and tilled too deeply with machines that are too heavy. The enormous destruction takes place out of sight and without a sound from within the deeper layers of the earth. Soil doesn't scream and shout when it is crushed deep down below. Soils aren't cute or pretty. They don't bleed when harm is done. They don't show signs of reaction when they are strained and stressed. And so we think they are resilient and able to cope with just about anything we want to get out of them. On closer look, this is quite a different story. Ready for the roller coaster ride? It takes different periods of time before soil becomes so tired that nothing will work anymore. Soil fatigue is not a word that Frolan has invented, it already exists. Sandstorms in Germany, as in the Sahara, aren't a naturally occurring phenomenon. These storms are man-made. Soil can no longer hold its water. It becomes incontinent and everything that has been poured over it, like pesticides, fertilizer, heavy metals, is being washed out into streams, rivers, lakes and oceans. In the Edaphon, there live billions and billions of creatures that provide us with life we can find floralistic root wonder worlds that make the barrier reef seem like a poor imitation of beauty. Fantastic world of roots, origin of life on earth. This rotistic diversity goes hand in hand with the action of the worms, improves the soil structure, preserves water and nutrition for the plants and turns life in the underworld into a planet of its own. Watch out! and take care of the ground beneath your feet so that it will still be a garden of Eden for the king of Edaphon. Thank you.